carefully. You don't live here, do you? You're just a babysitter. Have you been upstairs in the last five minutes? Why? I don't think you're alone in this house. Someone's upstairs. I've seen them moving around through the windows. You should get out of there. Now. Horror is both the easiest and the hardest genre to work in. Everybody and their brother seems to take a dip in the water at least once, whether it's Camp Arawak or Crystal Lake. But for every horror masterpiece, like Jaws or Halloween or Get Out, there are at least a dozen Troll 2s. Oh my god! So what makes some movies click with audiences on an emotional, visceral level, while others fall by the wayside and are relegated to darkened prints that are only available on YouTube or the classified section in Fangoria? It's not money. Some of the scariest films of all time have been shot on a shoestring budget. That's what makes them such a go-to for aspiring filmmakers. And it's not acting talent. For every Jamie Lee Curtis or Kevin Bacon, there are a hundred wannabe scream queens who never worked again, much less got typecast. No, I'm going to assume that the thing that separates a good horror film from a mediocre horror film is craft. It's the same thing that makes for any great film, and when it's not there, well... Oh, hi, Johnny. I didn't know it was you. Here you go. That's me. How much is it? It'll be $18. Here you go. Keep the change. Hi, doggy. You're my favorite customer. Thanks a lot. Bye. One unsung master of pure, non-flashy craftsmanship horror is Fred Walton. Walton's movies are far more famous than the man himself, and most of the people who do know the name only run in horror circles, while John Carpenter, Wes Craven, and even Toby Hooper are mainstream names. Walton's most famous works tend to be old-style claustrophobic whodunits and slasher films that can be shot quickly, cheaply, and most importantly, under a tight control. The original When a Stranger Calls and its short film precursor, The Sitter, features some of the most unnerving tension that you'll see on film. Trace the call. It's coming from inside the house. A squad car's going over there right now. Just get out of that house. Walton's follow-up in the genre, April Fool's Day, is a much more conventional slasher film in the vein of Friday the 13th. But it does showcase Walton's workmanlike professionalism when it comes to directing. In 1993, Walton convinced Showtime, then a distant competitor to HBO, to air a sequel to his classic thriller When a Stranger Calls. The story follows the same format as the original, featuring a harrowing 20-minute slasher movie sequence followed by a standard police procedural. But mostly, it's an absolute clinic on how to pace a terrifying horror sequence. This is one horrifying scene. The opening of When a Stranger Calls Back works so well because it utilizes the simple concept of the hierarchy of knowledge. In storytelling, the hierarchy of knowledge just means that different people have more knowledge than others at different times. Hitchcock loved providing the audience with information that the protagonist desperately needs, and then forcing them to squirm in their theater seats because the only thing that they can do is shout at the screen. The key to being a good director, and a good storyteller, period, is to know the right time to bring the audience in on information, and when to leave us in the dark. Well, the whole emotion of the audience is totally different, because you've given them that information. That in five minutes time, that bomb will go off. Now the conversation about baseball becomes very vital. Because they're saying to you, don't be ridiculous, stop talking about baseball, there's a bomb under there. When a stranger calls back opens with Julie Jens arriving at a neighbor's house for a last second babysitting gig. The house is big, but hardly ostentatious. It's not even isolated from next door neighbors, which we see in the establishing shot. Julia and the audience are immediately caught off guard when Dr. Schifrin opens the door before Julia even knocks. It's a jarring moment and it happens right as the opening credits finish. Right away, the audience is given four key pieces of information. So I don't expect we're gonna be home until, oh, 11, 11.30, is that okay? Sure. Your parents coming to pick you up? My brother, but he's gonna wait till I call him. Okay. We're late. The kids are asleep already. Do you remember where the room is? I'll find it. How do I look? <laughs> you look late. Beautiful, but late. <laughs> I've left the number where we're going to be on the door of the fridge. Okay. Bye-bye. And Julia, thanks again for coming on such short notice. Bye. 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 
all of this information is dumped on the audience in 38 seconds. The audience follows Julia through the house as she finds the children's room and checks on them. We sit with her while she watches MTV and she studies for a bit. Walton is sure to pan over to a ticking clock, letting the audience know that it's about 9.38, so Julia has about two hours to go. The six-minute mark of the film, Julia receives a call, but no one speaks. Hello? Hello? I think you have the wrong number. You do have the wrong number. It does serve a purpose, though. The phone is working. At the 6.30 mark, we're introduced to The Stranger. He has a small, unassuming voice, and he tells Julia that he just needs to come in to call a tow truck. And that, uh, that expires at the end of August of this year. At this point, The Stranger gives Julia and the audience another key piece of information. A name, an auto club number, a license plate number, and the make and model of a car. Julia does her due diligence, refusing to let him in, and she writes down the information so that she can call the auto club herself. I'll call them for you. Except, the phone isn't working now. Of course Julia is smart and cautious, which is what makes her such a good protagonist. She doesn't tell him that the phone isn't working, because that would tell a complete stranger that she's all alone with no way to call for help. Instead, she lies about calling and says that the tow truck will be there in an hour. The stranger nearly catches her in a lie, questioning why it would take more than the 30 minutes that they always promise. I have to pause for a moment here because this is the kind of tension that can really drive people up the wall. You have Julia, who is coded as being a nice girl. She's wearing her Catholic schoolgirl uniform just to babysit. She spends most of her time studying doesn't invite over any boys. She barely even watches MTV. She does all of the right things, so it's got to be hard for her to lie to someone who's in need. But all of that is in conflict with nearly two decades of women's self-defense theory. Julia puts caution ahead of nicety, and you can just tell that it's killing her. It's here where we get a strained glimpse of the stranger walking away into the night, wearing a long trench coat. Julia checks the office and confirms that none of the phones in the house are working. She won't be able to call her brother or the Schifrins. At 10.52, according to the clock on the stove, the stranger returns. Julia is in the middle of making tea, so she shuts off the kettle and we, the audience, see her turn it off. They didn't come. It's me. The auto club hasn't come. Since the auto club didn't come the first time, the stranger asks her to call again and confirms that she has the information written down. Julia pretends to call a second time, but when she returns to tell him, there's no response. Are you there? Understandably creeped out, she checks on the children one more time before she's interrupted by the sound of the tea kettle. At this point, for the first time, Julia falls beneath the audience and the hierarchy of knowledge because she's forgotten whether or not she turned the tea off, but we saw it in close-up. She pours a cup and checks the sliding glass door, seemingly out of boredom. At 11.15, the stranger returns, and Julia's worst fears start to come true. Not only does he not believe that she was telling the truth about calling, he's also angry that she's lying to him. When Julia tells him to ask one of the other neighbors, 
He reveals what another unnerving piece of information. You never called them, did you? You never called the auto fuck. Why don't you go bother the people next door, some other house on this block? I have. They're not home. Nobody else is home on this street. Just you. He apologizes for scaring her and asks her to call his wife to let her know that he's not coming home. And in the single most frightening moment of the sequence, when he asks her to check the information again, she finds that it's not there anymore. Julia now knows, and it's confirmed for the audience, that the stranger is somewhere in the house with her. The next five minutes of the film sees Walton unraveling everything in Julia's world, using our own knowledge against us until he drops the hammer. What have you done with them? I'm hiding in the bushes. Why? He's in there with you. Look into the living room. And that's where we're going to end. At this point, Julia, the stranger, and the audience all know that she's in danger. The hierarchy of knowledge has accomplished what it set out to do, which was dragging the audience kicking and screaming through a tense and horrifying situation. And that's the point of a horrifying scene. <laughs>